everybody. Good morning. Welcome to In Good Governance We Trust. Uh, I'm Alison Taylor. I'm going to be moderating the session today. It's going to be amazing. We have Anna Tunkel from APCO. We have David Flavel from Pepsi. And we have Christian Heidenreich from Vestas. Um, so we um, have observed uh, between us that there is a revolution uh, going on in terms of how we think about business ethics and integrity and governance. Um, over the last year in particular, there has obviously been a significant global focus and spotlight on the environmental and social aspects of ESG. But I think even more broadly, we are evolving from a consideration of corporate integrity, which back in the 20th century used to be about protecting the corporate entity from uh, litigation and, re and reputational risk, and now has become a far broader and systemic systemic issue um, really about how business interacts with society um, writ large. Um, similarly, we've also seen the G in ESG often limited to the topics of board diversity and compliance. And what we are really now seeing is a revolution in how companies are thinking about and managing integrity issues and really taking a far more strategic approach to these that go far beyond um, consideration of purely um, legal risk. Clearly, unless we can address governance issues within the private sector um, and really uh, progress collaboration between the private sector, governments and civil society, we will not deliver on the ESG framework or the sustainable development goals, and we will not ensure a sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Transparency and Anti-Corruption, which is now in our second year, um, we um, have been exploring these dimensions of the rise of integrity uh, for some time. And we are currently um, working on a paper coming out very soon called The Rise of the Chief Integrity Officer, where we're really exploring um, that dimension of integrity and ethics beyond legal risk. We're going to be laying out this playbook, which brings together best practices and trends from the private sector and multilateral development banks. And we're going to look about the alignment of topics such as integrity, sustainability, human rights, environmental justice, for achieving greater impact from the private sector and really transforming how we think about these issues. So I'm going to um, be asking for thoughts from our panelists in a moment. But what I would like to do first of all um, is ask everybody on the line a question, we're going to uh, see a word cloud when you have um, answered this question. But the question is, what key values does a company need to uphold to achieve good governance? I will give you a moment to react. Okay, so uh, right, um, enormous up there, integrity, transparency, accountability, coherence, trust, value of the common good. Um, I think that's very, very interesting. Um, but you can see these these words coming through that are that are really huge. And um, what I would really like to spend the rest of this panel doing is to talk about what these words mean in their actual practical aspects. Over to you, Anna, to, to react to this word cloud and talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing and give um, everyone on the line a preview of some of the things that we've found. 
Sure. Thank you, Alison. It's a pleasure to to be uh, in such great company of, uh, of collaborators and like like minded thinkers on on these critical issues. So I guess quickly reacting to the word cloud, of course, transparency, integrity, I would even say empathy are, are really critical values uh, from an organizational standpoint when we look at the, the road ahead um, for, for sustainable governance. But I would probably add one more, which is inspirational ethics. And this is something that you and I have been having a lot of conversations about and, um, and also is an emerging trend where employees of private or public sector organization no longer want to be told of what not to do, um, sort of using the stick of compliance, but really want to be inspired of what they can and should be doing um, on this path forward. And so perhaps sharing uh, you know, a broader trend um, that we're seeing collectively, individually as, as leaders in our organizations is this rising um, stakeholder expectations across the board from all different um, groups. So. Um, Employees uh, want their employers to be a lot more active in fight for social justice. Consumers expect companies to respect human rights in their supply chains and beyond. And local communities certainly expect manufacturers to avoid polluting air and water around their facilities. And they're sharing all of these expectations widely and uh, mobilizing communities across uh, physical and, uh, and virtual borders. And, and so as you rightly said, when we talk about the G and ESG governance, um, it goes, my further than just the, the, the governance component, but governance has broader underlying um, critical elements to, to fulfill the environmental and social um, pillars of ESG, from climate change to, to human rights to various uh, challenges that sustainable development goals um, seek to, to address. And so our Global Future Council at the World Economic Forum is somewhat a microcosm of the multilateral community, bringing many of us from, from business, but also um, leaders from academia and multilateral institutions. And this playbook that we've worked on over the past six months uh, draws not just on corporate best practices, but also brings to the table multilateral development institutions who often have to, to police and, and sort of represent this um, stick that has to uphold standards and penalties when it comes to um, economic development and investment projects. And so we spoke to various civil society organizations as well. And it's important for me to highlight that we're not talking about a role uh, or a function with this chief integrity officer paradigm, but rather consciously driving alignment between risk, compliance, governance, sustainability, HR, and oftentimes corporate and government affairs in, in any organization. And so, as you mentioned, we're going to be seeing this, this work published by the World Economic Forum next month. But I wanted to, to preview uh, five key trends uh, that, um, again, I'm, I'm seeing through, through my, my work at uh, APCO Worldwide, but also that we're seeing all collectively um, in our organizations. So first of all, there is an overall mission evolution. And as I said earlier, uh, this shift from policing to building a culture of integrity, rules versus values, I think today, first of all, organizations are equipped more than ever before with technological tools to do so. So crowdsourcing codes of ethics to chatbots that uh, address employee concerns in every part of the globe and business. Um, and so we need to create this shift from litigation mindset to inspirational ethics in all of our organizations. I think we also need to evolve with the skill sets that we're looking for, for people to uphold these functions in our organizations. So law, behavioral science, organizational psychology, sustainability and human rights, data analytics. I think we're looking at a brave new world when it comes to the types of people and skills we want to, to bring to the table to address these issues. Um, the third is advancing a common advocacy agenda. And it's interestingly uh, connected to what the UN Secretary General announced uh, on the eve of UN General Assembly that has began last week, which is called our common agenda. So Secretary General uh, Gutierrez calls for a renewed social contract between governments and people uh, towards stronger social protection. And I think we, we have a responsibility to do that as well. And many progressive companies today, and I'm sure David will share PepsiCo's perspective, um, have developed this alignment between that goes beyond immediate business uh, or industry agenda by advocating for issues that that our stakeholders care about. So in context of this conversation on governance, it's implementation of SDG 16, peace, justice, and stronger institutions. It's integration between compliance, sustainability, and human rights. And it is helping governing governments build corruption-free environment through e-governance, um, helping reduce red tape, and, and many other initiatives. 
The fourth is joining forces to multiply impact, an area that is near and dear to my heart um, at APCO, but um, also just observing that private sector can create this positive ripple effect by influencing economic systemic change by um, using these levers to, to help partners, vendors, suppliers transform their business practices, and also by joining forces with others uh, across industry line. Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, um, various other global processes are good examples of platforms that we need to bring government, civil society, um, and private uh, sector to the table. And finally, I'll leave you with, um, I guess, of a mixed bag when, when it comes to when, what we have when it comes to technology. Uh, on the one hand, uh, blockchain, e-governance, uh, chatbots, right? We've, AI, we've, we've learned about all the positive tools that can help um, speed this uh, you know, sustainable governance transition. But th at the same time, um, technology is also accelerating uh, the ways that uh, our system can be undermined through fraud and corruption. And so we definitely need new tools to combat, prevent, um, and detect um, areas of vulnerability that, uh, that plague our system. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful overview. So I'm now going to turn to um, our other panelists and get some thoughts um, from them. Let's start with you, David. Um, ethics used to be a little more simple. It was about ensuring that the corporation did not break the law. Today, as Anna has very well articulated, it is far more complicated than that. So maybe you could start off by talking about the evolution of integrity the issues in Pepsi and how you think about and approach the topic of in governance we trust um, at, at Pepsi and what changes you have seen and are, are still um, underway. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Alison. Um, and, you know, Anna put it 100% correct that, it's, you know, where we are even from five years ago is, is dramatically different. But, um, and I think you can see that Pepsi has been a company that's generally been sort of towards the, the forefront of, of sort of looking at things more broadly. You know, we've had for a very long time sort of key to our values and principles about acting with integrity and voicing opinions fearlessly. And, you know, our sort of values were around, you know, performance with purpose or updated lately to winning with purpose. Um, and so just looking at things from a pure sort of legal, ethical point of view, I mean, I've been with Pepsi for over 10 years and we weren't really even doing that 10 years ago. Um, but there has been a real step change, I think, in, in recent times. And I think even if you think of the major sort of um, upheaval in the world that the COVID um, pandemic um, has caused, I think is really, and, and other societal issues, has really caused people to look at it in a much deeper fashion when you start looking at the disparity between developed and developing markets around access to vaccines and all sorts of other things i think it has caused people to to continue to reflect and from from our organization's point of view you know just last week we announced and i'll be careful not to steal too much of our ceo's thunder because i know he's talking on another session later uh later this week but, you know last week we announced um what we call pep pep plus uh or pepsi positive i should say um and that really is sort of We've, we've had sustainability and human rights and other sorts of targets for, for a long time and principles and codes. But, you know, last week we really announced it's like it's not just sort of something that you add on to business. It's a fundamental relook about how we do business, you know, across whether people, planet, um, purpose and so on um, with some very sort of new and ambitious targets around, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and sustainability and, and human rights and, and, and the people agenda, racial um, equality and so on. Um, as I said, they've always been important things to us, but now it's like really like this is front and center with aggressive targets. Um, you know, we have a broad group of people who are responsible for this. It's not just the compliance chief compliance and ethics officer. We have a chief global chief sustainability officer who reports directly to the CEO. The head of compliance and ethics reports to me. We have a human chief human rights officer who again reports to me. Um, and you know our our procurement team you know has a very strong supply code of conduct and that's high on the list of imports for our our sort of global procurement team. So it's a uh, in an organization of our size with about 290,000 people spread around, you know, 150, 200 countries of the world, um, we have to take a broad approach, but it, importantly, doing business the right way and ethically and taking this broader view has to really be distilled across the entire organization. It can't be a rules-based approach. The whole company has to believe it and has to be locked in to, um, to drive against it. 
Yeah, I mean, with a with a workforce of 290,000 people, this is clearly about more than good intentions. This is an enormously um, ambitious and, and difficult to pull off undertaking to have consistency um, across integrity issues. Amazing to hear your description of how sustainability has always been very, very important, or, or certainly at least for, for the last decade. But now what I heard you say is that um, it's no longer just that it's important, it's actually core and has been incorporated into your core strategy um, in um, to the degree that you can no longer separate out the two, which is, I think, exactly what we're looking for. Um, Christian, um, I would love to hear your perspective on the same question. Um, what does the journey of, of corporate integrity look like at Vestas? Um, and maybe you could pick up on some of the points David raised and, and talk about what this looks like and how you think about this in a, a very different business. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, yeah, but... but Again, it, it's a journey, and you can say uh, if we start way back 2009, we signed UN Global Compact. Uh, uh, we had the human rights um, uh, officers sitting in the in the company from 2011. So on the on the human rights agenda, the the environmental agenda, it's of course always been embedded. I think. And the same with the compliance, but I think what 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 the change is exactly what what David described is that that the point of departure is you know legal you know it has to be legal we have code of conducts that's our internal tools and supplier code of conducts that that uh, that that we kind of work with um, but the thing is what what has changed is you know is it legitimate and that is where the where the extern, uh, external stakeholders uh, comes in uh, and actually. You can say, uh, look at us and say, you know, what you're doing is that legitimate, and that is that can be a different scale depending on who you are, where you are, where in the world you are, how you perceive the products we we make, if you're impacted by the products that we make, um, and then then of course, as as David also said, working with the culture, it has to be embedded. But what is it that has to be embedded in this? You know, you have the outside looking in on us and the inside us looking out and trying to explain, you know, what 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 are we doing? How do we perceive this? And I think that is the, the big change that we've seen over the last few years is that we need to be better to to align on this. We need to be, be better to have a common language around this uh, because, you know, the perception is that that as a, as a company, we are, we are responsible for everything. But it is an intersection between, you know, both uh, the, the 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 different opinions uh, and, and views on, on on this agenda, and I think that is also the whole uh, cultural change that we need to work with as as companies. It, it's not only black and white, because again, it's it's also the perception of what people meet. I mean, we are an organization of thirty thousand. Uh, we are we are in eighty countries around the world, but everywhere where we have people, they are met with different perceptions on this. So we need to build a strong culture both around. The, the human rights agenda, the, the compliance agenda, environmental agenda and all that in order to, to kind of uh, speak the same language. And I, I think that that is the big change that we need to work with. And also as we become more and more, uh, we learn more and more about the topics, we learn more and more about the integrations, the skills, the uh, cross-functional nature. I mean, that has to simply disseminate into the to the organization so that we have the, the, the you know, that we are able to answer uh, when questions are raised. <clears throat> And that's completely fascinating because what you've described as having a consistency about your external and internal messaging, which is also, of course, about considering both the risks to the organization and the impact of the organization, um, especially on environmental um, and social issues, and then aligning these things um, under a, a governance framework. Um, we're always already getting amazing questions from the audience, um, but let me um, ask each of you and I'll start with Anna, um, a question of um, how companies can champion the fight against corruption and connect it to other agendas like human rights and climate change. What have we learned, Anna, uh, during our research and what have you learned in your own work about what works and what doesn't work here? Sure. And I think it's um, there's a broader, uh, I think, framework um, that is applicable here in um, 
and looking at these issues through the lens of sort of the three A's, the alignment, um, authenticity, and, and, and advocacy. And this is something that, um, again, a lens that we, we often apply um, at APCO when looking at these complex issues. Um, and I think first and foremost, the authenticity part, I think companies need to focus on areas where they're most credible and can add um, sort of, and create the largest impact. Um, I think we're, again, seeing this through supply chains, through the specific industry initiatives. Um, I think alignment, uh, and, and David and, and Christian touched on this, it needs to you know, be aligned with uh, with the values that, that the company is championing, both at the leadership level, but I think be, being re truly reflective of uh, companies' um, culture and uh, and what it stands for. And, and finally, the advocacy piece, perhaps, again, my, my, my favorite and one that I'm more biased towards, but it's um, um, joining forces uh, with external stakeholders where, where there is that broader um uh, connectivity on on critical issues and in the in the context of this intersectionality between governance um, social and uh, and environmental issues it's um understanding w where can you uh, advance your mission further? Where do you as an organization have those strengths? Where do you have gaps uh, in addressing them? And where does it make sense to join forces with organizations like um, Ellen MacArthur uh, or CARE, um, Oxfam, um, that is uniquely aligned with, uh, with what you're uh, trying to achieve? I think when it comes to broader transparency and, and anti-corruption, there are a number of global institutions that, uh, again, many of us collaborate with, from, from Basel to Transparency International, that have also been part of this journey with us, where uh, it certainly makes sense to, to 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 join forces from a corporate standpoint to, to further the mission. Amazing. So, um, all right. So let's go to Christian um, next. Um, I think corruption is such an interesting topic because obviously it's extremely heavily regulated, maybe the most uh, heavily regulated business integrity issue globally overall. So has, um, I think is safely safe to say, traditionally been considered in a pretty purely legalistic way by organizations. So it's a very good kind of microcosm and way to make the kind of trends that we're talking about practical. So um, can you talk about um, how Vestas thinks about the fight against corruption and anything that you are, are doing or thinking about um, in terms of connecting it to the human rights agenda, the climate agenda, or anything else that Anna mentioned? Um, yes, I mean it's a it's a it's a big uh, it's a big question and a big agenda. But but what I think is interesting here is a little bit what I also alluded to before. The uh, if you look at it a little bit like a matrix, that where where do you have the intersections between both the environment, uh, human rights, uh, compliance, and so on? And I think that is where 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 the challenge is. One thing that we experience is of course that when we talk about the ESG agenda is that the E is relatively well defined. Uh, we have been working with the environment for many, many years and we can measure and uh, you know it's it's more we are getting down to the nitty gritties now uh, in order to communicate about it. We have a common language on the E. On the S, we are not there on the social agenda. I mean, we, we do have some uh, metrics, uh, but they are they are limited. We don't have a language. Uh, we still don't have a human rights language for business and how how that uh, interacts with with the uh, with the the states and so on is still being developed. And then you have the G, who is kind of governing all of this. And then uh, when I say the 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 intersection is is interesting because that's where we see that that's where the dilemmas uh, kind of uh, occurs. And that is again for us as a, as a company that where where we need to also be be brave enough to raise the dilemmas and be able to take the discussions in the public. And and one thing there for us, for instance, is uh, uh, um, when we look at at the the the, the need of uh, due diligence, both uh, from a compliance perspective, from a human rights perspective. Right. You know, we do the due diligence. We do our. Uh, you know, we have the tools to do it, but often we cannot disclose you know findings and so on because that that is within the business relation so how so should we be open then about our mythology on how we do this or how do we discuss these things when we cannot disclose it and i think that's some of the dilemmas that that we we tr try to bring forward but also try to to look at and to solve and then again as as a global company we also have a responsibility to 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 take part of that discussion and, and bring it up but that's also where i think that we can 
both champion this, but also move the, the, the needle to become more uh, defined on what is it we are trying to solve here. Amazing. Yeah. And, and due diligence is such a good example because it's an example where historically, um, if human rights diligence is done at all, it's done uh, separately from corruption. But there are so many issues um, suggesting that these methodologies should should converge. Um, we're going to move to audience questions soon. Please keep them coming. A uh, great uh, ones coming through already. But um, first of all, I wanted to get David's thoughts um, on this question of anti-corruption and these other agendas and some kind of practical granular thoughts. Given your worldwide presence, um, this seems a particularly interesting question for, for Pepsi. I don't know if there are any markets you're not present in, but um, I don't know of them if there are. <laughs> uh, North Korea would be one, I can tell you. But, um, so, but uh, there aren't many. Um, and sometimes through third parties, which is a whole other issue, right, as far as right. driving compliance with, with third parties and things. But, you know, Anna and, and Christian touched on, on these issues. And, you know, I'm lucky, Pepsi, we have very strong values so we've always been interested in ensuring that we you know comply with law and we when we do acquisitions or integrations you know due diligence is very important and things but uh, you know i think people still did see it until not that long ago they they saw it as important they saw it as critical to our values but they did look at it through a legal lens not that they needed to be convinced about it but it was a well, if we don't fix this or we don't find out about that, there could be a legal consequence as well as it not sitting with our values, right? But now as the company really does push forward on some of these broader environmental and human rights and, and other, other issues, and we have much more aggressive targets there. I mean, I used to say this in due diligence meetings before. It's like, well, you've got to, when you're pricing this asset, you've also got to build in the remediation costs and so on, right? Beyond just any possible penalties, it's like, because we fix things to suit our values, right? That's what we do. But now that we have these more aggressive targets and because now these are sitting in people's PDRs and there are people who have got job responsibilities to deliver on some of these things, they're now sort of coming to us much more proactively, like, well, we're looking at this, we're thinking about that. But, you know, what does that mean for hitting our, target for sort of, you know, zero admissions by, by 2040 or, um, you know, around um, recycling or net water positive and so on. So it's gone much more mainstream now where they were always interested, but it came from a technical kind of more compliance. What's the yeah. cost of doing business to a, no, no, I have these targets. We we're, we're running for them. How, what is this going to do to impact it and how do we make sure it's right and fixed? So it's a much more, they see the direct business lens a lot more now than, than they used to. So it's kind of like it's become sexy now, I guess is the way I would describe it for, uh, for some of these guys, not just a legal issue. Yeah, so you're basically connecting the commercial goals and the integrity agenda and, and being more intentional and realistic about those connections rather than the business does what it does and here's a compliance preventative process sort of bolted on the top. Um, this right. really leads us neatly to one of the questions from the audience, um, which is how um, you are thinking about um, incentives and performance management when it comes to ethics and integrity issues. So maybe I'll hear from you again, David, on that and then we'll we'll go to christian and then anna hmm. well i mean and again so in some in some cases you've got particular people have a job to deliver particular targets right so they are directly incentivized because that's that's what they have to deliver but more broadly now these broader targets and so on sit across many different people's actual PDR objectives and so on, you know, their performance development things. So there's a, a personal now vested interest beyond any normal integrity or values, now their own economic impact. But I mean, how our also um, the targets that our businesses are set and so on, many of these things are factored in. And we're also getting much better at things like, you know, if you have a, if you had a compliance failure and there was a cost to it, much better at sort of like, well, what was the real cost of that between, you know, not just fines, penalties, but loss of executive time, um, responding to issues and so on. How much time did you suck out of the business to deal with a particular issue and trying to put a cost to that and sort of getting better around the responsibility of people to sort of like, well, you're, it was this conduct that resulted in this true cost, not what you thought was the cost, which might be down 
here, just hold some legal fees or whatever. No, no, no. What was the true cost of the organisation? I think the better we can get about tracking those types of things, um, I think also helps in people really understand, um, you know, We've always been talking for years about damage to reputation and, and integrity and so on, and license to operate and things, which is all critical, but just getting down to better around, well, what was the true dollar cost of some of these things in the true sense? Amazing. And I've just done some work with Novartis where we found that for speaking up, it's incredibly important that employees see a good ratio of exemplary um, to unethical behavior. So um, yeah. you need to have some view that the company will act and take these issues seriously in order to want to speak up and raise concerns, which speaks to these kind of hidden cultural costs of how something like a corruption issue um, can really affect value over the long term. Yeah. Um, and we, I mean, because we, uh, sorry, but it's like, and um, it's just on that point, um, traditionally people didn't like to sort of talk too much about these sorts of things. Um, you know, and legal privilege, you know, Kristen sort of touched on some of the full concerns around legal privilege and everything else. But, you know, we push much harder now to sort of like, no, no, we're going to tell people how many speak-ups we had. I mean, within the organisation, how many speak-ups we had, how many were substantiated, how many senior executives may have lost their job. You can do it in a way which... It's not yes. like saying, well, this person did X, right? And it shows it's very important for the organisation to see that when they do speak up, that there are real consequences that, that, that happen from it. 100% and nothing degrades culture faster than the sense that there's a different rule for senior people um, and everybody else. So perfect example. Um, Christian, um, over to you. How do you think about um, incentives and performance management around ethics and integrity issues and how has this evolved? Yeah, but 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 just building on what what David uh, said, I mean, I mean, uh, for many years, for instance, we have have health safety targets built into the performance systems and so on, and of course that that always creates a, a special focus uh, on a on a on a on a topic. But again, as I said before, what is it we want to measure here? What is it? I mean, we we do have uh, strategies on 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 climate change, CO two emissions, and all the recyclability and all these things. But again, uh, come back to the social agenda. What is it we want to change? What is it exactly we want to do? And how do we measure it because if you do it the wrong way you know then 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 it doesn't help and coming back to 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 david's example also i mean uh last year we had 264 uh reports on our whistleblower hotline uh, and then i was in a investor uh, relations call and, and an investor asked us you know but shouldn't it be zero you know how come you can have 264 and we said yeah but if we have zero we know something is wrong you know, and if uh, if we have 264, we don't even know if that's enough. But uh, but that is what we have, and that is what we process. And 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 again, coming back, I mean, to to today's point, you know, that will have consequences. It will be investigating all these things. But again, just shows you know again the perception of what are you measuring and how do you then deal with it. So until you have the right way of measuring it in order to set the right course, then it's actually difficult to build it into to the targets and incentives. And that not saying that we shouldn't try, but it's just to give an example on that it's not easy. Yeah, no, it's certainly not. Um, and it's been f sort of flagged to me that, you know, very often you get a message from the company that speaking up is wonderful and valued, but also there is there are penalties for managers if speaking up happens on their team. So that's an example of the kind of mixed messaging that we need to do um, away with. Anna, um, from our other interviews and our other research, anything that Christian and, and David haven't mentioned that you'd like to add about incentives and performance management? Certainly, and also something that we've seen over the years, I think maybe one one internal and one external perspective. On the internal uh, point, just again, balancing this uh, element between financial performance and sort of strive for to maximize shareholder value with what it actually takes to get there. I think companies across the board um, are looking into this balance and focusing on what it actually takes to model um, culture of, of integrity as, as part of that performance. So ethical growth and performance um, as a business that uh, doesn't discount for, for, for the ethics part. Um, and I think on the external part, when it comes to incentives, I would also encourage us to, to think about the broader network of suppliers and vendors and the fact that companies today have a tremendous economic leverage um, in either elevating and celebrating trusted partners uh, or blacklisting them and doing so rather publicly uh, in a way that is known to, to the broader sort of ecosystem of their operations but also internally to employees. I think we all are talking about really walking the walk, not just talking the talk on those issues. And I think we, we really need to, to draw on those meaningful examples, both internally and externally from an organization. 
fantastic, wonderful, thank you, and a really great point about signalling. I'm hoping we have other good questions and some quite difficult ones that I hope we get to. Um, David, um, I know that you are heading from this uh, panel into a board meeting, so let's talk about uh, board capacity, board governance, and the relationship between the board and the management team on these issues. Sure, um, and you know we're, um, and this is all on our on our website. Um, you know we. Tone from the top, it's a, you know, people talk about it, it's a cliche it's in some people's mind things, but it's very, very critically important. And so, you know, we start from a very strong position as far as, you know, we have clear corporate governance guidelines that, you know, as I said, anyone can see them on the website, which, you know, very quickly sort of say the board is responsible for the, you know, oversight and ensuring that, you know, we have a global code of conduct and that that code of conduct is implemented properly and, and followed. And then, you know, so we start there and then we tear down to different board committees. You know, our audit committee is responsible for oversight of our of our um, compliance uh, program and, and code and so on and other key risk metrics of which things like human rights and a whole bunch of other things dovetail into that as well. And, um, and you know, so we have a clear structure. Um, we have, as I said before, senior executives, you know, to sort of either reporting to the CEO or one level from the CEO who handle these areas they have direct access to and regularly present to groups such as the audit committee. Um, they have executive sessions with the audit committee. So, if, you know, if, in, if the global chief compliance and ethics officer didn't think that I was taking a matter seriously enough, our audit committee directly deal with the chief of compliance, you know, in executive session and things so that they can raise any concerns or issues or, or just, you know, speak, you know, more freely if they felt that was necessary we and it just continues to roll down the organization we have a very structured every single business unit we have around the world bar where we have some very small ones where we might group them with some others have a um a, a governance council you know that has the controller and the chief lawyer and the cf and cfo and and um the head of hr and so on and they monitor and track all of our speak ups and what what we're doing in relation to them and that just rolls all the way up the chain all the way to the very top so that every quarter the head of compliance and ethics sits with the audit committee and sort of says we received x number of speak ups this quarter these are the sort of you know particularly serious ones and, but we report on all of them. We report on what's our substantiation rate, you know, whether it's proven or not. And to the point Christian raised before, most of our audit, you know, people like our audit committee and so on, they don't want to see that the number's dropping. They want to see that the numbers are increasing, that people are comfortable with speaker. They don't mind if the substantiation rate's 30%, as long as we feel comfortable that we're investigating properly and getting to the bottom of things. They would rather people over leverage and overuse this thing when there's nothing wrong in most of the cases, just so that people are comfortable that there is a system and they can use it and they, it's going to be dealt with, dealt with properly. Um, now, importantly, if you see your numbers going up, you have to understand why. Right, and um, and we look very deep into. If we sit, we track all the different businesses quarter to quarter, what's going up, what's going down, why were you restructuring somewhere, right? So you're going to get a lot of HR type speak ups and things. But we track all of that. Um, still not as automated as I would like, and there's a lot of elbow grease in it. But we look at it very carefully so that we make sure we, we're comfortable. People have trust in the system, but we understand why the numbers are doing what they're doing and that we feel comfortable that things are being investigated and we're getting to the bottom of issues. Um, and to one of the points you raised before about the, and then what do you do as far as third parties and what happens with them and things, that can get a bit tricky as far as, we certainly are quite vocal internally, sometimes not as vocal externally because the, the truth of the matter is sometimes where our standard is might not be where the law is in a particular country or we might not get it to a level of proof that right. say I could win a legal case on this. So sometimes we have to be cautious about, well, we might not tell the world that we're stopping doing business with somebody for a particular reason because it could have major legal ramifications, but it's clear internally that we're not dealing with a particular company again. Of course, um, integrity is about those judgment calls and, and conclusive proof of wrongdoing is harder to find. So we are making decisions about, about risk and integrity and the kind of relationships that meet um, our corporate standards. Um, Christian, same question to you, governance um, at Vestas and the relationship with the board, between the board and executives. 
Yeah, but but uh, again, I I mean, we we have a fairly similar structure as 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 David uh, just explained. Also, uh, I mean, it is a trickle down effect. Uh, the board, of course, uh, ask for this and 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 monitor it. But again, uh, it's I mean, it's that that's only the 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 messaging. I think the important thing here is also that the systems actually um, they 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 actually find the issues and then we deal with the issues and we we kind of make the corrective actions also and that also goes up in the system it's not only that you know that many cases that many dismissals or uh, warnings or whatever so so it is it is also to show that that um, that 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 we act accordingly uh, on these issues but again the structure is fairly similar as as uh, as what to what david just described Fantastic. Um, um, Anna, um, let me ask you something else because we're running a little low on time and there's all these amazing questions coming through. Um, the, the question is what advice you would give to someone who wants to improve ethical oversight in the, in the organization? Where would you start? Obviously not the five points you've shared already, but where should a company uh, begin this journey? I think the company actually ought to begin this journey internally. Um, and, you know, David and, and Christian shared so many great examples already of, uh, of their work in building ethical culture uh, within PepsiCo investors that um, I think the first uh, step is that um, soul searching and understanding from a com company, so what does the company stand uh, for and, uh, and where there could be some of the potential pitfalls when it comes to the organization, be it on the geographical level or on the market level. Um, and I think, you know, we will talk about the importance of, uh, of stakeholders and also this balance between uh, risk and materiality and ESG and, and impact. So I think we ought to have a really holistic view on what stakeholder expectations are of, uh, of us as a company, as, as an industry, um, in, in informing the, the broader uh, journey in building sustainable governance. Um, and so really being strategic about um, understanding these stakeholders, understanding their priorities, and also where do they fit relative to their expectations, we cannot satisfy everybody, um, I think, organizationally. So I think creating that rigor and, and prioritization of expectations, I think, is important. And a third element that I would mention um, is sort of building a sense of both regional and global networks uh, around these issues. Um, I think uh, most of us on this call, on, on, on this panel, are part of the, the B20 process um, and their uh, integrity and, uh, and compliance task force. Uh, there are a number of other networks, of course, through World Economic Forum's uh, Apache community um, in OECD um, that are really crucial in building uh, and sharing best practices, building that sense of community um, and, uh, and camaraderie in championing those issues, but I think it's a third pillar that is really important to consider. Great, because there was another question on multi-stakeholder governance and thinking, which you sort of yeah, answered. Absolutely. No, I didn't ask you like you read my mind. Um, David, I know you have to jump. Final word of advice for the audience about where to give this this begin this journey. Then we'll let Christian have the last word. It's a big question. Uh, so, um, I think it's uh, it's very strong messaging that has to be supported from the top. I, I said it before; it sounds a bit of a cliche, but I even think about I think about in certain parts of the world where we sometimes have interactions with government bodies, and they you know they look or an individual looks for something that's inappropriate and so on. A clear, unequivocal no from us um, is is quite a compelling thing. It, sometimes it might take a little longer for something to happen, but once they know that a no is a no. And you're not sort of umming and ahhing about it. Um, that counts a lot. And I think to make sure that you know from the very top and middle management is critical here. That there's not much sort of like oh well if we look at it for that angle uh, you have to be pragmatic and practical and sensible. Um, but it's kind of like when there's something that's wrong, it's a clear no, and people understand it very quickly. If you see a, everyone in lockstep that. If that's not right, if that doesn't work, then that's our that's our position, that's our values, and it's a no. Um, and I think that's a very powerful tool, as well as making sure you then have all the structures and everything else that um, that comes in place. But if you think you're going to be able to command and control from a small group in headquarters, 
and police everything around them, that's not going to work, right? It has to be embedded across the entire organisation and you have to have ambassadors. You have to have general managers and other people when they're holding sales meetings or whatever it is. I mean, it's not rocket science. When everyone is talking about driving performance, they're always finishing with, the, oh, we've got to do it the right way. We've got to do our values. People's, you know, your organisational health scores should test these things. What are people saying, not just about are they happy working somewhere, but are we true to our acting with integrity? Are we true to our voice with voicing opinion fearlessly, right? What are the metrics of those? Make sure management are measured against them and that you're talking about and you're continuing to look for all the different data points that can point you as to whether or not you have the true culture in your organisation. And if you don't, where are the big ticket items that you can try and do to, to, to make the wins and, and move it along? Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Um, Christian, closing comments from you, please, on, on this question. In a little bit like like David always said, I, I mean, what, what is really, really important when you have built the structures and you have built the whole pyramid of, of reporting that we explained before, that is that you create the, 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 the speak up culture, that you actually create through management, middle management, you know, the, the, the culture where you are allowed to say stop or you're allowed to raise questions about this, because that's the only way that if you can talk about things in the open and that you can test the gray zones and you know all of that and have the conversation that is that is the only way you you you'll get this embedded into to the culture and the decision making from uh, you know the front line until the the the, the top management that 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 would be my take upon it Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, David, Christian. Amazing panel. Um, please join Patchy if you would like to work further on this. Uh, lots and lots of information and resources there. Um, and please look out for our report launching next month um, that will give a lot more depth on these questions and those we didn't get to. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us today.